Margaret Curtis's paintings are gorgeous and lush and haunting, filled with allegory, historical references, and connections to what she calls cultural collapse. I want people to look. I want to disarm them with something that's so visually engaging or beautiful or sumptuous or something that they are going to spend time looking at and contemplating something that's very often disturbing. I'm Matt Pikin, and this is The Overlook, a daily podcast about the news, arts, issues, and trends of Asheville, North Carolina. Margaret Curtis is one of my favorite painters in all of Western North Carolina. She lives in Tryon and has a solo show running through May 27th at Tracy Morgan Gallery in Asheville's South Slope. We talk today about the personal and communal trauma informing her work, her subversive commentary as torches for feminism and climate change, and the balancing beam she walks in her work between darkness and beauty. Matt Pikin here from The Overlook. I'll be back to my conversation in just a moment, but I'm asking you, the listener, yes, you, listening, this very moment, is The Overlook making a difference in your connection to Asheville? Do you know more about what makes this city tick and where we're struggling? Let me ask, if you had to give up one cup of coffee every month to do your part to keep this show going, would you step up? If you answered yes to any of that, and I really hope you did, Please support The Overlook by giving just $5 a month. Your support keeps this show free for anyone to hear. Go to patreon.com slash The Overlook Podcast. Supporters get free tickets to my first live podcasting events, and I have some very cool items that come at higher levels of giving. Your support means the world to me. Go to patreon.com slash The Overlook Podcast. You'll also find a link in all our social channels. I began my conversation with Margaret Curtis by asking about how she began addressing her social and cultural concerns through her artwork. I've been working with ideas of the loss or the pressures on our natural world and how the forms of nature are changing as culture expands. I've been working with that notion since the 90s that we didn't have an idea of climate change at that point. That wasn't like a term, but it was clear that nature was being impacted and that our relationship with nature was becoming more and more protective. And this concern has been around for a long time. Of course, it has changed as the effects of climate change are becoming more and more profound and deadly and shocking. And we have the language and the idea and the science to talk about it much more directly. What might be a little bit different in this particular body of work is discussing a sort of our cultural collapse, which is happening at the same time. That's something you've, since I've known you and your work, the cultural collapse in the moment of this collapse is something that's punctuated your work. And for you to marry the two, the cultural collapse and climate change, the cultural collapse element coming into your work, that came first, right? Yes. I think that was something... I became aware of in art school, sort of how the grand narratives which formed our capitalist, colonialist society were falling apart. And this I became aware of in the 80s. And now we're really seeing everything unraveling. And I think they're very strong forces that want to put everything back into those tidy little boxes, and it's not going to happen. There's a lot of ways to define that collapse and view that collapse. It can be from a macro level or a micro level. You have a real knack in your work of taking the macro and distilling it into the micro, into specific people, little windows. Yes. Is that something that you were even aware you were doing when you started this concern in your work, approaching this concern? The macro and micro relationship of the same forces has always been something that is very interesting to me. And I don't know how much we want to get into my personal autobiography. but A little, because okay. I think it's germane to your work. Sure, it is very germane to my work. I grew up 
in Tennessee, but my father was Bermudian and a staunch royalist and more British than the British. He was <laughs> as much a lover of empire and a colonialist as you can get. And that was really hard. It, it made no sense to me. And I think because there was such tension between his beliefs and growing up in rural Tennessee, I could see it from the outside. It always, like, like what we talk about as intersectional identity politics now and intersectional forces, I saw that from a very young age of my father. He basically had contempt for everyone. And he always, as a white European male of a certain economic status, he was at the top of the hierarchy and everybody else was positioned below him. And I was always aware that his racisms, his classisms, his misogyny, all of these things were part and parcel of the same thing. So I, and, and I was also aware from a very young age of the gaslighting that goes on around maintaining those and hiding, cloaking those power structures. This is long before we even had the term gaslighting. Oh, you, yes. Yeah, I mean, you were aware that he was cloaking and masking and obfuscating. Yes, all yes. that yes. from a young age. And you said, did you have support in this view of this, in this vantage from other family members, from your mother or no. siblings? You didn't. Not at all. I was a family scapegoat. I, I was like the focus and the locus of all negativity in the family was just directed towards me. And that was really hard. But the good thing was I got the hell out of there. Like my first opportunity, I went off to college and that was that. I, ne I never went back. And so there was something very freeing. And I think other family members who didn't receive so much, receive something positive from the family were able to stay involved much to their detriment. In a way, it worked out very well for me because I was able to leave and make a clean, clean cut. Like, I've been watching these power dynamics from a very young age. How did you make sense of them in terms of being able to have the next day and the next day? And you said as soon as you went away to college, you were out of there. Did you know that even before you went away to college, I am escaping as soon as I can? Or did, was it only in retrospect, once you got away, that you were able to begin making sense of what you'd experienced? I was very rebellious as a teen, and so there was part of me that was just very angry, very rebellious, and very eager never, ever to go back to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I went to Duke first for right. college, graduated from there, realized I wanted to pursue art, but didn't have enough of a portfolio to apply for graduate school. So I went to the Atlanta College of Art, which was a wonderful place to study art, very freewheeling. A lot of really good people have come out of that college. And after that, I ran off with my film professor, which totally <laughs> disgusted my family. And we went up to New York together. And that, that was the real clean cut that once I made that I guess you could say it was a poor decision. Why do you say it was a poor decision? It's one that I don't regret. I mean, it led to your artistic initial it did. success. And I don't regret it. And I'm grateful to him. And I will be grateful to him till the day I die. But he was in his 50s. I was in my early 20s. There were power dynamic uh, totally. problems there yes. too. But so best decision of my life? Probably not. One that I regret? Absolutely not. I'm, like I said, I will be always grateful to him for that. But you found success in New York. Tell us about the kind of work you were doing early in your career, in your 20s and early 30s? I first started showing work in New York that was very, very femmy, very... And let me talk a little bit about how that came about. At the end of my time at the Atlanta College of Art, I won a fellowship to spend a summer at Yale with their, in the Yale at Norfolk Summer School of Art and Music. And it's a very intense two month period of art making and very rigorous. And I left that program at that point, and it cha has changed a lot since then, but at that point they really were pushing like the visual language. It was very much about, in my mind, and 
probably truly, certain notions of art making that privileged white male artists. And I was really trying to do something different and was not getting much support there. So I left that program very angry. And when I got to New York, I'm like, okay, you want my work to be a certain way. I am going to make it as obnoxious to those standards as I possibly can. You were being subversive within art, within your art instruction. Yes, very much. And I thought, so what is the thing that is most anathema to the painterly canon? And so I thought cake decorating, cake decorating. And so I started going to restaurant supply stores and buy and learning how to do all these cake decorating techniques because I wanted to bring painting into the decorative, into the home. I wanted it to be domestic and I wanted it to be super subversive at the same time. So I was making these incredibly femmy, frilly, over the top paintings, which were pretty feminist and in your face. So formally, I learned a lot in those early years and my subject matter has changed a little bit in that I've just become more and more interested in how feminism intersects with culture, not culture, but climate and nature and the earth and our relationship to that as a capitalist society and what we're doing to the earth. So all these things are very intimately woven. Your paintings are almost collages of all of it you just said. Right. Fem- feminism, climate change, cultural decay. All of that can be found in any given painting of yours, at right. least in your recent work. Were you doing that back then as well? Yes, I was. And I'm really drawn to images, imagery that has a history. And back in New York, what I would do is I'd get in the subway. I lived in Brooklyn, and I would go to the Mid-Manhattan Library, and they had these huge image files. And these were analog, Xeroxed. You could go to the file for parade floats, and there would be all sorts of Xeroxed images of parades or bicycles or flowers. You name a topic, there was a file, and you could go through there, and then you would Xerox that image and bring it home. So I've always collected a lot of imagery. It's infinitely easier now with just downloading images from online. So these found images that you're talking about, in some ways, and I can see how this plays out in at least some of your work, it's almost as if you took content selected or curated objects from a flea market. It's that kind of approach in a way to your construction. It's detritus. Right. Like detritus, it's all yeah. detritus. Right. We're just surrounded by so much stuff, so much content, so much, you know, landfill. Like, you know, we are a culture of, we're a mound building culture, like, you know, the, the early cultures in our area, but where our mounds are of garbage. They're not places where the priests stand on top or the chiefs or their mounds of garbage and travel along any highway. And that's what, that's what dominates the landscape, yeah. these massive mounds of our detritus. So we're inundated with imagery and stuff. And uh, so, that's a resource. So some of your works, at least the ones I find most impactful, have people in them or right. have figures in them in addition to this detritus. And when I see those works, I see them as frames of a story. Do you, when you're painting them, do you see them that way? Do you see that this is a snapshot in a story? I think all my work is narrative. Even the work that doesn't have a human figure in it. I craft, I work on narratives which may or may not convey in their entirety to the viewer. That's not so important to me. But narrative is, I think... We are storytellers. Storytelling is very powerful. There's even some thinking these days in scientific circles that we self-domesticated as a species through storytelling. So storytelling is very much a part of our humanity. And sometimes, really, I'm working from a place that's more raw and immediate. I need to convey that 
maybe mm -hmm. like with Portrait of My Anxiety, that was very much a self-portrait. Yeah, that was very clear. Yeah. It's to explain for listeners, and correct me if I'm getting some of the details wrong, but it's you embroidering and you're completely immersed in your yarn. Yeah. <laughs> and so you see these needles and you see this expression on your face of kind of concern, but you're still knitting. Like you can't help but keep knitting and you're just covered and you're going to continue to be covered. You're creating more coverage for I'm, yourself. The figure is completely covered in knots and is knitting. And, you know, is she, has she done this to herself or what's happening as, is this neurotic or is she covered in this net already? You know, very much, what is the genesis of that anxiety? Is it external, internal, some combination of the two, which is probably it? Of course. Yeah. But this is one of the more uncommon works for you that is self-referential in that way, right? You, you have other works, not necessarily in this show, that one piece that stands out in my mind, and you've had bloody works at times. And there's one where I, it's a, I guess a hunter He's coming through the forest and he's carrying a bag and li human limbs right. in this bag. And there's like a little trail of blood. I think if my memory serves me correctly, yes. like at the bottom of the bag and on the ground. And this hunter doesn't look at all happy. There's no, it's the body language suggests the burden of all humanity is on this person's back. Oh, that's interesting. Well, it's what's really interesting to me is two paintings you just mentioned, Portrait of My Anxiety and The Hunter One, which is called American Family of Four. Both came to me in the same way, and which is unusual. I was driving, and the image just popped into my head completely fully formed. And Usually I'm working more from an idea or a narrative or sometimes even a phrase, a sentence, but these came to me fully formed. And they both have sort of a fairy tale quality to them, I think. A little grim, a little, they're dark, but there's something primal about them too. And I grew up with guns. My grandfather was a famous hunter actually. A famous hunter? He was a how do, famous how hunter. How does someone become a famous hunter? There are books out there. Captain Paul A. Curtis, you can Google him. And there's some book out, I've forgotten the title of the book, but there's a chapter on Annie Oakley and a chapter on my grandfather. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, he was really into it. I was taught to hunt or to shoot from a very young age. But the thing that I was really working from in that painting is like when I was taught how to handle a gun, it was with the ultimate respect for the fact that this is a lethal weapon. It is a deadly weapon and you have to be extremely safe with it at all times. And I feel now there's such a fetish around guns, like contemporary gun culture is something that I think my grandfather would be mortified by. Mm. I think he would have zero tolerance for it. People talk about guns as if they're no more deadly than a jar of mayonnaise. And that's simply not the case. So jar, if you consume a jar of mayonnaise, that could kill you. <laughs> I guess that's probably true, but a lot, a lot more gently. Well, I want to forward a little bit to your current work. Correct me if I'm wrong here. There's only one prominent painting where there's a figure in it. There's like a mother and a child. Right. And the others are more like landscapes, but they're not at all traditional landscapes. They're more like photos of something that happened here. Yes. And some, and there's decomposing objects and these objects blend, like they were organic, they were living. There's a, almost puppetry type faces and objects, but these are decomposed and deconstructed in the scene of these otherwise desolate landscapes. Is that a new direction for you in your work? And what, where does that come from? You know, living in the South and also spending a lot of time out in New Mexico, and that's a 1,500-mile a drive in one direction from here to New Mexico. You see a lot of billboards, and you see a lot of billboards in various stages of decay. And I, I really started thinking about these billboards and how they're just a great metaphor for 
culture because somebody puts up a sign because they're trying to sell you on an idea or they're trying to lure you someplace. And so they've got a pitch. And like culture's always sending us these pitches for how things are supposed to work. But these billboards, they're deteriorating, they're collapsing. And I tried to use one of them as a cowboy and the rugged individualist and how that whole notion, which is such a part of the American mythos, it doesn't work anymore. It's no longer valid. And the other billboard is of sort of an iconic 50s era modernist uh, female femme fatale type. And uh, she's crying. And I keep feeling like there are forces out there who really want to put us back into those boxes, even though they simply don't function anymore. It's not going to happen. When you're talking about these forces, are you meaning like this push for a cultural conservatism that's a throwback to the 1950s? Or earlier. I have lost the right to decide what happens to my body. That is so huge. And in fact, I did the cowboy painting after Texas Uh, around the time that Texas instituted its bounty that it put on the heads of women who are simply trying to do what's best for them and their families and um, have some say in in what happens to their bodies. I, I, I really cannot even believe we're in this particular moment right now. It's not going to work. We simply don't have a society that's set up I just don't know what's going to happen when women are forced to bear children against their will. What, what's going to happen to those kids? What's going to happen to those families? Or is it just going to plummet us into poverty? Have people really thought this through? Because there are no structures to help with that. And like we have the science to hold males responsible for their part in conceiving a child. Yet I don't see any discussion about that. Speaking of of men, you have a piece in this called Cucko Clock. Which yeah. I, I, now, ta- describe this piece. <laughs> there's there as one of the pulleys on the clock. There's like these drawn down silver testicles. I think truck nuts. Truck nuts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That piece really came about during the fall when Ahmad Arbery and Kyle Rittenhouse, and both of which have to do with white supremacy. And I started thinking about, do you remember the case of James Byrd in Texas, who was years ago dragged behind a pickup truck? Many years ago. Yeah. A black man picked up by random hateful white people and dragged to his death. I've never forgotten that. And the Ahmaud Arbery case really reminded me of it. And I was thinking about how, like, there's a whole pickup truck culture, and the pickup oscillates between being a tool, a useful vehicle, and a weapon. And a lot of pickup truck culture, a lot of the decals on it, on trucks, a lot of bumper stickers and the truck nuts, they they really play with the menace of the pickup truck being a weapon, but it's very cleverly cloaked as if it's innocent and all in good fun, even though it's not all in good fun. A lot of the stuff on pickup trucks is very deliberately menacing and hateful. And that's a part of our racial dynamic in this this culture in America. Like we we are white people can be so menacing and hateful, but we all pretend that isn't what's happening. And I see it very clearly. And I think that gets back to growing up in a family where I was gaslit from the time I was very young. I see that menace. I'm sure a lot of people do. <coughs> this is not unique to me, but it's it's very real to me. And so anyway, I came up with this idea of a cuckoo clock because the obvious verbal pun on how cuckoo things are right now in our country, we're just nuts, we're crazy. And I wanted to make a cuckoo clock that was very much about all of these fetishes and the denial around these fetishes in our culture. So it's a lot of gun references. There's a Punisher skull in there. There's The whole thing is 
been blasted apart by gunshot, the truck nuts. I didn't and even know they were called truck nuts. That's, <laughs> that's how far removed from that culture I am. <laughs> I actually, I did a lot of research for that painting. I yeah. actually dragged myself into a gun shop because I wanted to see what was being sold. It was very uncomfortable for me. I was just going to ask you how very, that hit you. Very uncomfortable for me. But yeah, I don't know I, if I can get into this on the podcast, but they're like stickers that have like breaths on them and it would say guns and titties. You're really touching on this the, this relatively recent cultural phenomenon and maybe this was, it existed in previous generations, it just wasn't called this and it certainly didn't have this violent manifestation, the incel. Yes. And you're really touching on that in, these, yes. in this work. Yes. I, all of these things are so deeply linked. The yeah. misogyny, the racism, the innocence and oh this is all just good fun when really the incel type is gleefully tearing people apart so you know you're very active talking about this on social media you're very upfront and unabashed and i'd say hooray at the same time your art i wouldn't necessarily call your art protest art it's I, and I think you're deliberate not to do that. You're much more artful in how you deliver these messages. Is it important for you as an artist for people to understand the underpinnings of this work or does that not matter to you? It does matter that they convey. And I think that's why I spend so much time on the paintings because they can take months and months to, to build up. I want people to look. I want to disarm them with something that's so visually engaging or beautiful or sumptuous or something that they are going to spend time looking at and contemplating something that's very often disturbing. The cuckoo clock painting, that was probably the hardest painting I've ever done because I was staring at this imagery that I found deeply disturbing for months on end, and it was emotionally exhausting to me. I deliberately worked in a way that's not necessarily fun for me to paint. I like to build my marks very loosely with what I call dumb marks. These are not finessed marks or blended. They're not skillful marks. They're just slapped on, and I like to build specificity through the accumulation of those marks. But in this piece, I really wanted it to be trompe l'oeil. I wanted it to be hyper-realistic. What was that word you said? Trompe l'oeil? Trompe l'oeil. That's I, French for fool the eye. It's okay. something that looks very, very realistic, okay. almost three-dimensional. And it's a different way of working the oil paint for sure. But I felt we're living in a moment where people can attack our capital, threatening to kill our <laughs> vice president and killing police off, killing and wounding police officers. So we all watched that in real time. We all saw that. And yet half the country is pretending that these were tourists, right? So we're not even believing what we see with our own eyes anymore. And so I wanted to make this painting as realistic as possible just to monkey with that whole is this real or not are you gonna are you gonna deny it even though it looks real or does it seem more real to you because it's hyper realistic like really just tinker with that yeah you're using a color palette that is a bright generally a pretty bright color palette i do and that's deliberate too i imagine to juxtapose against the darkness of the content yes Yes. We've all seen, and I don't want to dismiss work, that some work is just, I used to teach, and one of my students was a self-declared vampire, and <laughs> it truly, and he, his paintings were always done with like red and black, and it's, oh, it's so cliched, and it isn't obvious. dark, it's so obvious, it's so easy, and you do see work sometimes, it's very much like that, and I want to approach the subject matter and this darkness from a very different angle because the darkness is interwoven into the positive and more joyful aspects of life too. They're not, it's not separate. Talk about that a little more so that you want your viewer to confront that they, that it's not a clean separation. Just to be real. Let's be real. Let's be honest. I feel that we're under such pressure all the time 
to pretend that we're all happy or that to dismiss the negative emotions and to downplay them, the toxic positivity that I think we all get a little weary of. And I'm not trying to indulge anything negative, but it's there and there's no reason to hide it. I feel like I'm capable of experiencing great joy and I'm also capable of experiencing great sadness and fear. And I don't see those as separate. I love the term toxic positivity. I don't think I'd heard that. Oh, really? When you said that term, I was like, yes, that's all around us. It is all around us. For sure. Now, every artist, certainly at your point in your career and your stature, you want to sell work. Have you found that you have a line of collectors who appreciate the darkness beneath the beauty? Or is that always a tough market for you? Is it always a tough sell? I think it is there's a limited audience and there are a lot of collectors out there but I'm not yes I would love to sell my work but more I want to communicate if my work is going to be in a museum that's even more exciting to me because more people are going to see it that's the drive is really to communicate and the faith because it is an act of faith is that if I communicate effectively the work will be seen and appreciated by somebody who it speaks to. I want to thank my guest today, painter Margaret Curtis. Today's conversation happened inside the BB Theater in downtown Asheville, which owners Susan and Giles Collard have been so gracious enough to open to me to record my interviews. Our theme music for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes courtesy of the Asheville band The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes are online by 6 a.m. every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up for our weekly newsletter at podavl.com. And please support the show by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash The Overlook Podcast. I'm Matt Pikin, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook.